All right, hi and welcome everybody. Uh, this is the kickoff session for the hands-on machine learning book. So uh, we did icebreakers. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, chapter one of the book. Before I do that, just a little bit of background, a little bit of uh, intro on the book. So um, there are code examples um, for the book that the author has created here on GitHub. And this information, I, I will send out, well, I'll, I'll send out the link to the notes um, on Slack. I guess, I guess we can also, I don't know, Ryan, if you can put that in the, in the chat for people. Yeah, I'm grabbing people. that right now. All right. Um, and so, so that's, that's extremely handy. Um, if there's, I believe that in addition to just like, hey, here's some, let's say it's talking about linear regression. And it's not just, here's some code talking about linear for linear regression, but also any of the like diagrams that are in the book, like the code that actually produced those diagrams is, is in there it's all, as well, as I recall. So if you have questions about anything, um, you should be able to tinker with it. So that's a great resource. Uh, the book itself is, is organized into two parts. Part one is called The Fundamentals of Machine Learning, and it's nine chapters. So it's gonna talk about the data science process and then ultimately get into classification, trees, ensembles, clustering, PCA, number of different algorithms. So really, really great foundational um, machine learning topics. And then part two is, is completely devoted to neural networks and deep learning. So there's 10 more chapters, uh, talks about what is a neural network, how do you train them, and then gets into some different of um, neural networks, CNNs, RNNs, Gans talks about reinforcement learning. Um, obviously a book at this level is uh, not gonna be able to go into super depth on, on any one of these topics, you know, jumping off point, especially if you're not familiar with these. And, you know, I love going through all this stuff because I find I, I learn more and my understanding is deeper every time we talk about these things. And I actually love it when people ask questions, um, it's like, you know, they ask like, well, why is that? And then it's like, that's a really good question. Why is it that way? I, I don't know. Um, so, so definitely um, for everyone, you know, if, you, if these things aren't familiar to you, uh, this, these are the great foundations to know. And even if you are, uh, we welcome the expertise in helping answer some of these questions. But also, like I said, I find that um, it helps deepen my understanding when we go through these. So Ryan already did the spiel about SDML. And so uh, I'm not going to go too much into this, but you know, we, we're going to have other events and we may even do um, some weeks after the book club, we may have a topic that's kind of related to, um, to the topic at hand. Um, so if we have some things that, you know, we think are interesting. Um, I'm also going to, you know, let you guys know if there are other events um, that we think are really cool. And so one thing I wanted to mention is uh, our sister meetup in, in DC, um, October 20th and 27th, they're doing this two-part series about attention and transformers. And they're mentioned in this book, but um, really I would say 2020 was more really the year of the explosion of the, the transformer um, model for neural networks. And so it's not really covered in that much detail. And so this would be a, a, a great supplement to that. And so I have a link here, um, but they're in the evening, they're DC. So it's a little bit on the earlier side if you're here on the West Coast, but, uh, but I'm actually really looking forward because there's, there's been so much ground taken in terms of state-of-the-art performance, people building uh, models using transformers. All right, so that's it for the, the um, sort of the setup and, and the structure of the book and the book club. So we'll be meeting weekly. Um, we take a week off for Thanksgiving, then basically we'll finish part one by mid-December and then we'll start fresh neural networks in January. That's kind of the, the tentative timeline. You know, we'll, we'll have to see, you know, we could have some whatever, just issues or, or scheduling conflicts, speakers, you know, whatever. Okay, so chapter one, um, the foundations about machine learning. So it starts off with these two sections. What is machine learning and why use machine learning? And I'm obviously uh, abbreviating the content here, but the author says that, hey, machine learning is computers learning to do a task from data. 
And the classic example that they use is a spam filter. So it tries to decide, you got an email, is this spam or is this a real email? And uh, you, you could manually write, hand write a bunch of rules, um, but these days we use machine learning and it's trained on examples of actual spam emails and actual real emails. And over time you can retrain it, you continue to train it so that as spam evolves, your spam filter also learns what the new kinds of spam look like and can tell the difference. And the counter example that the authors give is if you were, if you had a really big hard drive and you just simply downloaded a copy of Wikipedia onto your hard drive, that would not be machine learning because it's not actually doing a task with all that data. It'd be a lot of information, but it's not actually learning how to do something better. And in terms of why we do it, there's a number of different reasons mentioned. Um, and in the case of the spam filter they give, they say it's like, hey, actually training an algorithm to learn from the examples is probably easier than, than trying to program a, you know, a bunch of rules. If you're trying to do natural language processing, it's so complex. Uh, linguists have been studying this problem for years and they haven't been able to come up with a set of rules. Um, and so you can have a really big computer model and it can actually figure things out that it's just too hard, too complex for a single person to do. Um, it's easier to automate things. So something like a spam filter, you just retrain it. And then uh, one of the things they mentioned is sometimes you can actually kind of go in the other direction. You can uh, train a model uh, to solve a machine learning problem. And then you can actually inspect that model to say, hey, what did it learn? What did it figure out? Uh, for something like, you know, spam filter, maybe it's not that interesting, but if you, you know, have a model that actually does protein folding, you may want to then kind of peer under the hood and see if you can figure out what are some of the things it's doing to decide whether this thing's going to go straight or whether it's going to bend back or whether it's going to spiral or whatever. So that's my like quick recap for those first two sections. Um, let me just pause here and see if anybody has either questions or comments, something you want to add, um, uh, any experience that you guys have in terms of, of these, you know, general issues of like, you know, when's a good time to use machine learning? All right, you don't have to, but you know, uh, have this be a community thing. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, I mean, the one thing that I think uh, was missing from the book and I've seen, uh, I would say is missing from a lot of the books I've read on machine learning is the consideration of the ethics of machine learning. You know, there's been plenty of examples of people, uh, you know, basically uh, suffering the effects of poor models or models that are biased towards certain groups. And I think it's important to keep that in mind and, you know, make that more of a focus of, of our studies. <clears throat> mm, that's a, that's a great point. I hadn't really noticed that, but now that you mentioned it, it just seems glaring. Yes. Um, so there's, you know, many different aspects of that, but I would say quite clearly models that don't work well are problematic. So if you have a model that works really well for men, but it doesn't work well for women, that is, that is highly problematic. Um, and then another, of course, big problem is if you just use the model, not for good, but otherwise. So is face detection being used you know, to suppress people as opposed to actually you know, um, help people? So I think those are, are amongst many you know, broad issues around the, the ethics. And I would like to just point out the I'll be brief, but, you know, slight little blurb on bias that they did bring up in the book about how, you know, the sampling of data can actually have a major impact on your results. And that is something that you very much have to pay attention to and be aware of as you build out your machine learning models. Yes, yes. We are going to uh, talk a little bit more in, in the next sections in terms of like what are some of the challenges? And, and definitely, um, if you have problems with your data, it will cause problems. And then I think we're gradually learning that no matter how hard you try, you may have things you know, embedded in, um, 
in your data. I, I think I posted this on the Slack about a month ago. I read an article and somebody pointed out that in the English language, um, words like cow and, and pig or whatever, the words for animals um, derive from like the old English or whatever. And the words for the foods you eat like beef uh, come from French, they come from the Normans. And so at one point, I guess there was sort of this this thing where the, the aristocracy had these Norman roots. And so the peasants who tended the cows provided beef for the wealthy nobility who were eating it. And so I didn't even know about it, but so there is this hidden bias just in the fact that, that you know, we say cow and we say beef and you know, may not be a big deal today, but but that's just like one teeny example of like a bazillion of these biases that could be fully baked into the language. And, and how do you possibly, you know, root out and account for, for all of those? I also seem to remember that a while ago that Amazon has a problem of the hiring. They didn't know their model was biased or database was biased. But they were running the model to hire that men or women equally or something, but it wasn't really working, or it was somehow no one realized the bias towards uh, men. So they were using that model, they ended up to hiring men more than women. That something like that. And then they realized uh, recently a while ago that uh, so, oh, that model wasn't really working and then they took it down or something. Yeah. Have you ever the, heard of something like that? It just Yeah, the, the model accurately followed the data it was trained on, but the data it was trained on had a bias towards men. So it faithfully reproduced um, what the data was trained on. So it faithfully reproduced that bias. Maybe the next book after this one should be uh, Weapons of Math, Math Destruction. That, is it Kathy O'Neill? Yeah, that's an interesting book. That would be, an, that would be an interesting one to do a book club on. <laughs> I haven't read that yet. Ryan, have you read that book yet? No, I haven't done that one, but I have heard about it. I read it, it's interesting. Ted's mastered the art of being still. Oh no. Mercury <laughs> strikes again. You guys see me? Yeah. Yeah, you're oh, back. Welcome back. Oh. You know, I have a really good internet connection. This is the first time I've had issues. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to move on and hope that things um, work out. So the next big section. I went too far. The next big section is types of machine learning systems. And um, the, the book will talk about this a little bit more in terms of uh, some of the different types of learning. We could, we could you know, spend um, a while, but I'm just gonna sort of hit lightly, um, you know, four general areas you can divide machine learning into. So supervised learning. Uh, so you're using labeled data, and so this is where we talked about, right, Amazon trying to build a model that predicts, you know, who, who's a good hire, who's not a good hire. And so you have classification and regression problems like that. Unsupervised learning. Um, I don't really know exactly how to, to properly say all the possible forms of unsupervised learning. You know, I, I wrote like unlabeled pattern recognition. And so you have things like clustering, some of the anomaly detection, uh, algorithms are, again, using this unsupervised pattern recognition, where it's basically saying, hey, this thing seems very different from most of the other things. Uh, there are actually anomaly detection algorithms that are supervised too, just as a note. Um, Semi-supervised learning, they, they, the author introduces the issue of um, supervised learning works really well, but labeling the data is very expensive. I would say that 
even more work has been done since this book was published in this area of trying to figure out um, how to best do machine learning without needing, you know, 10 billion samples, um, things like that. And then reinforcement learning is, is kind of very different from these others. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, teaching a bot to play a Mario game or to play chess or go or poker or something like that, uh, robots navigating, that's definitely reinforcement learning. And so there are the ideas that you have an agent and it's sequentially choosing actions and it's trying to maximize its numeric reward metric. Um, and that's, that's the whole setup, but then of course it gets very, very complicated, especially for a hard problem. How do you, how do you actually teach it to, to, to try to do the right things? And then how do you get it to learn in some somewhat reasonable amount of time? Because you know, the problems that they're now working on, like protein folding and you know, no limit you know, poker are just so huge in terms of the, the combinatorics of all the different possibilities. You know, you see these things where it says like, oh, well, if you were able to whatever, do, you know, one possibility per microsecond, it would take you longer than the lifetime of the universe in order to enumerate all the possibilities for the game. Um, let's talk about batch versus online learning. And so really kind of think of this as, you know, are you just sort of saying, here is the amount of data I have and I'm going to train you? Or is it going to be something where continuously you're adding new data and you're, you're having the model update. And I do recall there was a, a, a bit of a warning there that when you're doing online learning, you have to be very careful because if you get some bad batch of data, then you're online. You know, it can corrupt your model very quickly. And before you know it, you know, everything's off kilter. So you really have to monitor in that case. Um, and then an interesting distinction. So instance-based versus model-based learning. I don't think there are that many instance-based algorithms, but the idea is, am I just taking some of the relevant examples from my data and using them, or am I building some sort of theoretical model? And when we have a theoretical model, then usually what we talk about is that they're parameterized. So um, the parameters are, uh, um, uh, are, are the numbers that, that, you know, the model has certain uh, ways in which it can in fit things and the parameter, the values of those parameters are um, how the model's actually specifying. So, uh, I don't know, uh, any comments or, or questions just in terms of types of machine learning systems? I thought this was uh, a pretty good overview and um, I don't know. Any thoughts, anybody? I I want to chime in because Becky's asking a question about like where where do you get labeled data sets potentially, um, and so I there there's some good links being put in there. There's there's some stuff that was mentioned in in one of the pages, um, but I just want to add sort of a side comment that. Um, it just depends on what you're interested in, because some things you might not necessarily need to do a labeling process. If it's some business thing and you have a database, for example, and it's got a whole bunch of just data in it, um, and then it happens that you're trying to predict revenue and revenue is already in that database or something like that, then you don't actually have to do any labeling. You, you have the data available and you just have to um, pull it in in a certain way. So in, in some problems, you do actually have a labeling thing, but in others, you, you, you just have raw data and because you picked a certain target, it, it is labeled by just like uh, virtue of, of the structure of the data. Cool. Anything else? All right. Main challenges of machine learning. So in theory, we could have an entire session that really just talks about these different issues. Um, this is, uh, I think really understanding these issues is sort of the difference between you took some classes and you know some algorithms and like actually usefully solving real problems. Um, so we're not necessarily gonna go into the depth here, but I invite people if they have you know, comments to talk about this. So um, insufficient quantity of training data, the way a lot of machine learning models 
look today, if it's doing image classification, doing natural language processing, huge volumes of data is one of the differences between the, you know, the best models and just, you know, okay, good models. And that, that is somewhat problematic. It also creates, you know, an issue between sort of, you know, these companies, you know, the big ones that are the haves and everybody else is the have nots. Um, Non-representative training data. So, um, you know, have this issue all the time. Um, I, I have complained on multiple occasions about a, a competition where we were trying to uh, identify different birds by their bird calls. And so there was this huge problem where the examples they gave us to train the model were these bird enthusiasts with these like really great audio equipment and these parabolic microphones, you know, honing in on like this one bird so that we could get a really good recording of, of, of it. And then what they wanted us to predict was somebody walking around with their iPhone. And, and there's like wind noise and like steps and like, you know, rustling as they're holding the phone. And it's like a minute long. And sometimes there's a bird like really, really quietly in the background. And it's just utterly different, not representative of, of what, you know, the real world problem was. Poor quality data. There's lots of things we could say there, but uh, I will just add that, you know, Cleaning data is really important. And, you know, you see a lot of memes and jokes and comments about how it's, you know, 80 plus or minus, you know, 10%, you know, 80% of the time people spend is dealing with the data. I think there's some discussion, some movement, you know, Andrew Ng is talking about, hey, maybe we should be focusing more on the data and less on the models and the algorithms. Um, so that's something that's, that's coming up. Um, irrelevant features. Features and feature engineering, you know, we have books that we've, you know, tried to look at that there's, there's a lot that you could say there, but, um, you know, the simplest thing I can say is just because something gave you some slight improvement in your model doesn't mean that it actually will generalize, doesn't mean that it's predictive in general. Um, overfitting uh, is, is, a very complex issue that actually arises in sort of the training and the hyperparameter tuning of any algorithm that you use. So whether you're using XGBoost or a neural network, uh, understanding the issues of overfitting um, are, are really important. And so um, again, I welcome, let me just hit this last point and then I welcome you know, anybody else that has comments, but. Like I said, we, we could have spent an entire hour and a half just talking about these issues and projects that you've worked on where you ran into one of these or the other. Uh, but then the last is underfitting. This tends not to be a problem. People will tend to try multiple different algorithms. So you're not only going to do like a linear regression, you're gonna try other algorithms. Um, and so um, generally speaking, you're not gonna have only models that underfit the data. All right, so let me pause here and open the floor for, for people to add their two cents. Or hey, examples. Ted, this is Anne. So you mentioned Andrew Ng with one, but I, maybe an adjustment to that first bullet, insufficient quantity of training data, maybe that needs to be insufficient quantity of good training data. Because another point that I specifically recall Andrew making in one of his talks that I saw was that it's the giant companies and he didn't name them by name, but you know, Baidu, Google, those, et cetera, that have been putting forward this misconception that you need masses amount of data. And so I, my takeaway from that was just a good amount of data is good enough. It's not necessarily the more, the better. There is some limit. And then I'll chime in with, it's also going to depend on the type of model that you're building. You'll find that it, at least in my experience, like the um, deep learning models traditionally need more data than your traditional like supervised learning models and things of that nature. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. I would like to note one thing, which I discovered when I was working with my uh, linguist students. Uh, there is some difference between metrics machine learning provides and actual practical objective people have because not necessarily optimizing 
provided metric. And even, you know, sometimes uh, it is seen that uh, when you do keras, for example, you have uh, one type of arrow and you have another type of a metric. But there is a, some, you know, disagree disagreement between the metrics and actual objectives. And I'm surprised it is not mentioned here. That's a really good point, actually. And if I can chime in with, you know, an, a challenge that isn't up here, but I think, you know, as I delve deeper into uh, machine learning uh, math, you know, understanding the under uh, pinning math that uh, drives all these models, I, I think it's becoming clear that it's an important to have a good sense of, of all those uh, maths that go into it, linear algebra and whatnot. Uh, so that's a challenge that I, at least for myself. Yeah, you know, the math is a tough one for me. I'm, I'm pretty good at math, but, but you know, when I kind of hit, reach my limit, um, it's hard. So I feel like there are some things that are really important to understand. So for example, for a tree-based model, um, scaling the data in theory should make absolutely no difference. So, you know, whether your data goes from zero to 100 or your data goes from zero to one, um, as long as it's in the same order, you know, scaling will make no difference to a tree-based model. Uh, so understanding things like that, you know, will help you because otherwise you could spend a lot of time engineering things that are just, you know, a waste of your time um, as, as well as, you know, other deeper aspects. Um, but I do find myself, you know, somewhat limited. I, I've been trying to understand variational autoencoders and I'm really just struggling. Um, <laughs> so I will just share that. So and I can add something, you know, uh, the, about the insufficient data, the quantity of data. There are other methods like uh, augmenting data. So uh, especially in computer vision, it actually it's very a uh, common way of uh, generating synthesized data. For example, everybody uh, know about the famous example of um, digit re recognition. And actually you can just rotate uh, number one or two and you know, just uh, de deform them, change the quality and actually generate uh, more data to make the uh, neural network um, more efficient. So it, it sees more variants of a data. It's the same data, you just create a data that um, uh, make the model more robust when it sees different handwritten numbers or yeah. and another way of increasing the number of data is, which is very famous and common in different fields, especially computer vision. Thanks. So, so, so Ted and team, uh, I do have also a probably a real life challenge here in terms of insufficient uh, data. For example, one of the things that we're trying to predict is really the box office uh, for all the new movies coming out, right? But it is um, technically a new world that, that we're living in now, right? <laughs> with, with first the, the general COVID concern, but then uh, it subsides, subsides a little bit. And then now there is a Delta and all of that. And, Part of the challenge for us is that we could make the argument that there hasn't been, well, there haven't been any uh, substantial amount of movies coming out and, and there's no way for us to kind of make enough observations on what movies would, I mean, the, the kind of the uh, characteristics of the, the movie uh, uh, data, right? Like, like the kind of audiences that are going and, and who expresses interest and but who actually doesn't show up or who shows up but has not been captured in the in the data that we're collecting. So uh, the reality is that we have some major misses in our forecast this year. And so like I was even telling the early group that uh, that's the challenge here. But unlike the image data or maybe there are some other solutions in terms of uh, creating that synthetic data that could enrich a little bit of that that um, I mean, the training side that we are having. Uh, are, are there any other data? I mean, uh, ideas like that out there for more tabular data? <laughs> I mean, th there are there are techniques, you know, um, um, 
for, for doing synthetic data. But what I would say is that, right, so you've hit on a number of these. So all the data pre-pandemic is probably not representative right now, mm -hmm. right? And then I would say that actually uh, one way of thinking about it is that data augmentation is really um, doing more to solve the overfitting, okay? So if you only had 10 movies post-pandemic, right, y you know, your, your model, you know, just isn't really going to have a lot of information with which to, to make its predictions. Um, so there you'd really want to heavy, heavily regularize it or simplify it in order to at least have it do something and not just, mm -hmm. you know, overfitting. But at the end of the day, especially because I believe with the movies, you have sort of this unusual distribution where you have, you know, a small number of blockbusters and it's yeah. really important to know if it's going to be a blockbuster or not. And, and so that's, that, that's a particularly hard problem because you have imbalance in your data where you have fewer blockbusters and it's really important to get those right as opposed to like, you know, for some other things you're like, oh, well, that's just an outlier. We can just ignore it. <laughs> that's right. not the main point of it. That is part of the main point. So I would say that I'm, I personally am not sure how you can get around this problem because it's so intrinsic to what you're right. trying to mm -hmm. So, yeah. in, can I add something here? For uh, the imbalanced data, you know, it's very common thing, for example, in fraud detection, for example, because most of the data you have, there are safe, there is no fraud, and there are limited number of fraud. And then you want to train a model that actually sensitive to fraud, which is the model hasn't seen a lot of. And there is a, a method called the smoothing which is going to create synthetic data they're using unsupervised learning. So it uses some of the, uh, it actually pick up the features that make those, um, for example, fraud situations and actually create data based on the uh, um, closeness to those type of data and in the uh, balance the um, data set. So the model can see the, the more of the fraud examples so it can be well trained. Otherwise, because it's mostly seen the good data, so it may miss some of the frauds because the, that's how it trained. So it sees most of the things that were not fraud. So that's one thing. Yeah, uh, I, I've seen that too, the one that Al was talking about. Um, and it's, you know, and essentially it's anomaly detection techniques is what you're talking about to detect the anomaly and train the system to find anomalous behaviors, such as how do movie sales work in a pandemic, post pandemic environment, or, a, uh, you know, if there's a Delta, if there's going to be a, I don't know, a gamma wave or something like, let's hope not, but, but if there's a gamma wave, how would it work in that, that, uh, Model. And what you have to do then is go through your, your data, pull out the anomalies, and then train the model to gener a generative model to create those anomalies. So that's something you might want to look in. Yeah, some, some good, good ideas here. Thank you, folks. I, I think that um, the conceptual challenges still is uh, even I, I, can, I can definitely see the possible um, relevance of the fraud detection. And fraud detection is actually a relevant one because there could be brand new fraudulent behaviors, right? So how, how do you really compare to the existing training and, and learning and, and we still identify the brand new behavior as fraud, uh, fraud? Yeah, thank you. One, one additional point, I have a friend who she always reminds everyone that machine learning models are really good at interpolation, but they're not very good at extrapolation. So if, for example, if you have like housing data or something like that, and you have a whole bunch of housing data and it's got housing between uh, 500,000 and 2 million or something like mm -hmm. that. And then in that data set, you've got all kinds of houses that have two bedrooms to seven bedrooms or, or something like that. Um, and it's got square feet and all of these different features in, inside of it in order to predict these housing prices. Um, it's going to be very accurate in the ranges that you give it, 
But if all of a sudden you give it a house that has 25 rooms and 10 square feet, that's outside of the range that it's seen in the past. So it's not really going to be able to extrapolate to that. And that's kind of analogous to the scenario a lot of people are seeing with COVID right now is things are just not happening at, at the rates that they normally do. So it, it's kind of difficult to, to reason about that stuff. Well, I was glad to hear that. Thank you, Doc. So they, I sometimes ask to my boss, so they, uh, what is that expected value, purchase value or something for the drug that's not, that hasn't hit the market yet? We don't know. So they, we have to really, ex, as you said, extrapolate based on our experience or data in the past that is similar to drug, but we cannot tell. And then especially nowadays that those newly coming up drugs are tend to be orphan drugs. That's uh, drugs for rare disease. So their case, their number of the patients are already very small to begin with. So it's, yeah, sometimes, so my coworker and I struggle with what to do with this to estimate the cost for this type of drug when that fit to the market. But yeah, in this case, maybe machine learning may not be a good tool for this. Maybe traditional something like simple using Excel or something might be better. Just wondering. Yeah, it's interesting. Like if you could take the pre-pandemic data and train a simpler interpretable model, then maybe you can extrapolate from that model a lot easier than if you're using a very complex, you know, sophisticated thing like, you know, uh, random forest or, you know, whatever, um, like GBM, something like that. All right, just looking at the time. So I'm gonna mention the, the last section in chapter one. Uh, talks about testing and validating. And so, of course, it mentions, you know, you want to have a train test split. So once you've built a model, you are going to ultimately run it against the test data to see whether or not the performance is similar to the performance it had on the training data. And if it's if it's worse performance, that's a red flag. Uh, so, so you really want to, you know, be careful of that. You don't always see if it's a very beginner discussion of machine learning the discussion about validation. So I was glad to see um, it talk about that here. And we can kind of go into more depth. You have to be careful because you can actually overfit to your validation scheme. Um, and sometimes it's unavoidable. You just want to try and, you know, minimize it, you know, not have it be too bad. And I would say within this area, there's another um, topic which wasn't really mentioned, which is um, leakage. And sometimes there can be some very subtle ways in which information leaks um, into your training data. Um, I don't know if anybody can think of a really good example. I mean, I can think of the really obvious, you know, things that you want to avoid, uh, but sometimes there can be far more subtle ways in which um, information that you won't really know in the future when you're trying to predict a future problem but there's some traces of it that make their way into the, the, the training data that you have, either the which examples you chose or into certain fields or whatever. And so I, I think one example of leakage that might be relevant to the ethics portion is that you can have data sets where you try to be fairer to all groups. So you take out all features that explicitly say race, gender, et cetera, but perhaps you have other features in your data set that correlate with those in less than perfect ways, they can still, your model can end up learning those as proxies in ways that end up making your model biased even when you tried to avoid it. Uh, that, that could be a form of leakage where you've accidentally told the model that this person is a certain race based on other features in the data. Thanks, Robert. That's all. That's really awesome. Yeah. So maybe zip code isn't perfect, but you can infer a lot about race from that. 
or maybe maybe uh, certain things about your profession and your education and background aren't perfect predictors of gender, but maybe there's you know a certain amount of leakage and stuff in there. So I think yeah, that's that's a really good one. Thanks. All right, so Ted. Anything? I think you alluded to it, but anything that you use to evaluate your model, like your validation portion or the test data itself, if you're using it to determine this model is better than this other model, then it is a form of leakage, isn't it? If you use it more than once, you always run that risk. If you if you actually are 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 lucky enough that you only use it once, then there's no leakage. Oh, the very fact that you're selecting a model based on the result from that particular data set oh. tunes tunes your choice to that gotcha. to the leak date there's leakage gotcha yes yes so so if you are you know hypothetically if you're unlucky and your test set has all women right then 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 you're you're, you're right you would tend to pick up whatever model works best for women and, and it may not work well for men right so ideally, you want to have a, a good representative test set. Uh, but even when you do, it's not necessarily going to be exactly perfect, right? So that's a good point, Leo. I have another example of leakage, a data set which I've seen, um, with which I worked this summer. They had around 200 people. And they, in particular, had the age written up to two decimals. So it means that by this, uh, you know, age and decimals and some other uh, column in the data which they have, they can pretty much pinpoint every participant. Okay, yep, so, so. And they used random forest, so which is exactly what it does, you know, with random forests, you can run into such kind of overfitting and data leakage very easily. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for the extra examples, guys. So if I remember right, I haven't reread the book uh, recently. Uh, we're not necessarily going to talk about all of these issues um, extensively as we get deeper in the book. The book will focus on the individual algorithms and, and, and you know, people's understanding of those. But I think this is a very good overview. And like I said, th there really are deep issues with how you train and what models you select and things um, if you're really going to be successful and, and not accidentally do bad things like have an overfit model that doesn't work in reality as well as, you know, you thought it was 90% accurate, but then when they actually run in the real world, maybe it's 65% accurate. All right, so I think we will, given the time, so we will wrap up the, the formal section here. So thank you to whoever was the first to suggest we not do the second icebreaker before the content, since we um, ac actually, you know, really, I thought the conversation was great and the time was well spent. So, um, so, so thanks for, for steering us in that direction. And then next week, um, I believe is the end-to-end -end model and and I cannot remember um, who signed up for, for that. Was it? Okay, it, Ian, it, great. So, so Ian, I'm really looking forward. And again, um, you're free to, uh, if you wanna just do an outline like I did, you wanna have slides, you wanna use a Jupyter notebook to walk through, whatever way you want. Um, and it'll be great to just, um, hear your voice. Uh, actually, it'd be great to hear your voice. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but also just, you know, um, to take the conversation and to get different perspectives. I I, I'm actually looking forward to having people present things differently than the way I, I do. I want to hear like different perspectives and different styles. So that'll be uh, next Saturday, same time, uh, noon Pacific.